Hi everyone, my name is Julie McCreary and this video is part four of the Unit 1 series on biological basis of behavior for AP Psychology students. This particular video will cover psychoactive substances. So first let me put this video into context. As you can see, it falls right after the neuron and neural firing and that is because you will learn how psychoactive substances act on the nervous system to influence the way our neurons communicate. So before we start, let's take a look at the key focus questions for this particular video. By the end, you should be able to answer these two questions. After watching this video, you will also be able to define the following essential concepts. So to begin, let's talk about neuroactive substances. Neuroactive substances are chemicals that affect the nervous system and the way it communicates. They can be classified as agonists, antagonists, or reuptake inhibitors. Agonists increase a neurotransmitter's message, they can mimic a neurotransmitter by fitting into their receptor sites, effectively acting like the neurotransmitters they're resembling. For example, an agonist similar to norepinephrine can bind at its receptor site, increasing alertness and heart rate as seen in the diagram here. An example of a norepinephrine agonist is albuterol, which is used in inhalers for asthma. A common side effect of albuterol is jitteriness and increased heart rate due to its action on the sympathetic nervous system. A key point to take away here is that agonists act like or increase or enhance a neurotransmitter's action in the synapse. The next type of neuroactive substance is an antagonist. Antagonists inhibit or stop or block a neurotransmitter's message from moving through the nervous system. Let me give you an example. You might remember from video part three that too much dopamine in the synapses can be associated with schizophrenia. The symptoms like hallucinations and delusions are believed to be linked to that excess of dopamine in the synapses. And the first generation of antipsychotic medications were antagonists for dopamine. They were used to stop the symptoms of schizophrenia by blocking dopamine from entering its receptor sites. And this is an example of a substance that is being an antagonist in the nervous system. You can see in the diagram on the screen the difference between agonists and antagonists. While the agonist is mimicking the neurotransmitter and promoting the message, the antagonist is stopping the message or blocking the receptor site. Finally, the last category of neuroactive substances you need to be familiar with is reuptake inhibitors. Reuptake inhibitors enter the synapse and stop the process of reuptake, ultimately leaving more neurotransmitters in the synapse to continue sending a particular message. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors that are also known as SSRIs are commonly prescribed as an antidepressant. And as you know, serotonin is responsible for mood regulation. So SSRIs like Prozac and Zoloft enter the synapse and partially block the reuptake of serotonin, which leaves more serotonin in the synapse to continue sending messages about mood regulation and mood enhancement. Like neuroactive substances, psychoactive substances enter the nervous system and directly affect the way it communicates, but more specifically, psychoactive substances affect the way the brain and the mind works, such as our ability to think, feel, and act. We will focus on a few broad categories of psychoactive substances. Those are stimulants, depressants, opioids, and hallucinogens. And you can see in the diagram on the screen that some substances have shared qualities of two or even three different categories. And you might even notice that this particular diagram places opioids inside of the depressant categories. But for this video, I will focus on the categories that the College Board outlines, and I will share the substances that they mention, as well as a few others. But it's important to keep in mind that this is just an overview, and it's meant to be more of a broad take on these categories and substances. And since it is just an overview, they, it really won't do justice to each of the substances and categories, especially because many of them are complex and come with larger societal discussions that warrant deeper study if you're really interested in them. So your primary focus should be to explain the categories and then be able to classify the substances that the College Board mentions. So let's define a few terms that I will use frequently throughout the next few slides. I just want to make sure we have a shared understanding of these terms. The first one is addiction. Addiction is referring to a compulsive drive, a, a deep desire to either do a behavior or to consume a substance. And addiction can be psychological or physiological. When we're talking about substances, though, they typically have both components. The user uh, psychologically feels like they have that need to consume, but their body is also having that drive to consume that substance. The second 
term on here is tolerance and tolerance refers to an experience that occurs when continued use leads to diminished effects, which actually requires the user to consume more of that particular substance in order to um, experience those same effects. Withdrawals refer to the physical discomfort or distress that happens when the user stops that taking that substance or performing that behavior. And withdrawals can be um, a variety of severity levels and also it can last different lengths of time. So the first category is stimulants, and you can see at the top of the screen in the blue text box that the College Board wants students to be familiar with caffeine and cocaine as stimulants. I've bolded them on the screen, but I'll include a few others here just to highlight some other common stimulants. These substances carry a variety of withdrawal symptoms, overdose probability, negative side effects, and even legality. But in general, they all share the same property of stimulating and exciting the nervous system. In general, stimulants speed the body's function and provide energy and increased heart rate and breathing rates. It enhances attention and focus. People use stimulants to feel alert and boost mood and enhance performance. However, stimulants can carry a variety of addictive properties and and some have higher risk of overdose. You are likely familiar with caffeine and nicotine because they're both widely used among Americans. Caffeine is the psychoactive substance in coffee, tea, and energy drinks. It's difficult to overdose on caffeine from those ready-made products that have the controlled amounts of caffeine. Things like Starbucks coffees or Arizona sweet teas, those are, are controlled and very, very, very difficult to overdose on caffeine. However, energy drinks do carry higher quantities of caffeine and can be dangerous in larger amounts, especially for those who have pre-existing heart conditions. And those who purchase caffeine supplements have an added risk because those have um, an uncontrolled amount of usage where you can control your own dosages. So users should be very cautious and read the instructions and dosages on those caffeine supplements. Nicotine is the psychoactive ingredient in cigarettes, cigars, chewing tobacco, and e-cigarettes. It's a highly addictive substance and users can develop a tolerance that requires them to achieve those same effects where they need to have more of that particular substance. Those who tried to quit nicotine experience withdrawal symptoms such as cravings, insomnia, anxiety, irritability, and distractibility. And for those who endure those symptoms and cravings and withdrawals, typically they diminish after about six months. Cocaine is a powerfully addictive stimulant and an illegal substance. It stimulates the brain's reward pathways and nervous system, and it rapidly enters the bloodstream and depletes the brain's supply of dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. Within an hour, the effects usually wear off and the user experiences a crash that's agitation and depression. And in the diagram, you can see the illustration of cocaine in the synapse. And you can see in the third image how it's binding to the sites that normally reabsorb the neurotransmitters. Cocaine is actually blocking the reuptake of dopamine or epinephrine and serotonin. So those extra neurotransmitters are remaining in the synapse and intensifying the normal mood altering effects. Methamphetamine is like cocaine. It's another illegal, highly addictive stimulant. It triggers the release of dopamine and increases mood and energy and causes feelings of euphoria. However, users feel irritable and agitated afterwards. And over time, methamphetamine reduces the user's baseline dopamine levels and causes severe physical effects like tooth decay, skin sores, and rapid aging. Depressants slow and reduce neural activity in the brain and body. While the College Board emphasizes alcohol as a depressant, there are some other examples that I will share here um, with you that are also classified as a depressant, but I'll focus primarily on alcohol. Many students mistakenly perceive alcohol as a stimulant due to some of the observed behaviors they might have seen when someone is under the influence. However, alcohol is a depressant because of what happens in the brain and body. It slows brain activity. It slows neural processing. It reduces judgment and mobility. It disrupts memory formation. It reduces self-awareness regardless of the amount that's consumed. And prolonged and excessive alcohol use in a lifetime can lead to alcohol use disorder, which can contribute to over 200 different diseases and reduce brain matter over time. And you can see that in the MRI images on the screen. Alcohol impairs the nervous system with the body needing about one hour to break down 
on one drink. Excessive consumption slows reaction time, impairs decision making, and slurs speech. So high amounts and excessive consumption continue to um, depress functions and can eventually lead to depressing those vital and essential functions like breathing and heartbeat. Alcohol affects various chemicals in the nervous system, initially increasing dopamine and serotonin, blocking glutamate, and acting as a partial agonist for GABA, which is what's slowing that neural activity. Despite being legal for adults over 21 in the United States, users should be aware of alcohol's effects and dosage to prevent overdose, which can be harmful and even deadly. Barbiturates are sedatives or tranquilizers that slow neural activity. They can be prescribed to reduce sleep or reduce anxiety. Mixing depressants like alcohol and barbiturates can exponentially increase their sedative and depressing effects, um, which can pose very serious risks. People with harmful intent may sedate others by spiking their drinks, their alcoholic drinks with barbiturates. So to have that extra um, sedative effect. And so people in social drinking environments need to be vigilant and aware that that can happen. Benzodiazepines are depressants that are prescribed as anti-anxiety medications that calm the brain and body. You might know them by names like Xanax or Ativan or Valium, and both barbiturates and benzodiazepines act as agonists on the GABA receptors, which is those, the, those inhibitory neurotransmitters that are slowing neural activity. Opioids are substances that mimic the body's endorphins and give a sensation of pain relief. Opioids can be prescription painkillers like methadone, which include substances like codeine, oxycontin, Vicodin, morphine, and fentanyl. They can also be illicit and recreational substances like heroin. Opioids act similarly to the body's endorphins in that they are reducing the sensation of pain, but they also slow the brain and body's functions, which is why that Venn diagram also placed them inside of the depressant category. As pleasure replaces pain and anxiety, the user's pupils constrict, their breathing and heart rate slows and lethargy sets in. And people who become addicted to this short-term pleasure may pay a long-term price because of intense cravings and the need for progressively larger doses as well as extreme discomfort and withdrawal symptoms. When the nervous system is repeatedly flooded with this synthetic opioid, the brain eventually stops producing its natural opioids. The final category of psychoactive substances you need to be familiar with is hallucinogens. Hallucinogens are primarily categorized by their ability to distort perceptions. Some hallucinogens are synthetic like LSD, while others are natural substances like THC or psilocybin. I bolded marijuana on the screen because the College Board wants students to be able to recognize it as a hallucinogen. It's important to note, though, that THC is the psychoactive ingredient in marijuana and is responsible for the hallucinogenic properties. To give an analogy, THC is to marijuana as nicotine is to cigarettes. So regarding its hallucinogenic properties, I'll refer to it as THC. From the psychoactive substances Venn diagram that you saw earlier, you might remember that marijuana can blend into several categories. When consumed, it can produce uh, feelings like relaxation, improved mood, and even euphoria. However, it is THC and marijuana that contains the hallucinogenic properties, and the larger the quantities result in the greater the hallucinogenic effects. THC can amplify sensitivity to colors, sounds, tastes, and smells, and cause agitation, and in greater quantities lead to paranoia. Marijuana products are also used for things like medicinal purposes, like alleviating chronic pain, reducing nausea and chemotherapy patients, and even providing pain relief to those people who suffer from multiple sclerosis. However, it's important to note that marijuana can also impair learning and memory. It's also a predictor of a risk of traffic incidents, chronic bronchitis, psychosis, and social anxiety disorder. Now, to enhance our understanding of this category of hallucinogens, though, I think it's important to compare THC to LSD, THC in marijuana is mildly hallucinogenic, whereas LSD would be considered a full-blown hallucinogen. LSD is a synthetic substance that was accidentally discovered in 1943 by chemist Albert Hoffman. He described his experience or his trip as an uninterrupted stream of fantastic pictures, extraordinary shapes with intense kaleidoscopic play of colors, and a miraculous power 
powerful, unfathomable reality. So while some LSD trips are positive like that one, others can be terrifying and there's no way to really predict the experience or its duration. Users can feel trapped in a frightening experience until it wears off. The greatest risk of LSD is the possibility of panic or harmful behaviors due to a distorted perception of reality. The risk of lethal overdose of LSD itself is considered extremely low. However, LSD can cause severe psychological distress that leads to possibly dangerous behaviors or even accidents. So to close today's video, let's do a few short review questions. Remember, as we've done in the past, I'll read the question aloud, but you'll need to pause to determine the correct answer. Number one says, which of the following represents drug tolerance? Number two, Dr. Schill conducted a study in which she administered morphine, which mimics the action of naturally occurring endorphins to volunteers in hopes of determining whether morphine boosts mood. In this instance, the independent variable is... Question number three, 100 people reported the most impactful effect of a substance they recently ingested. Which classification of drug is most likely represented in the bar graph? Question number four, after ingesting a substance, Yi began to see geometric shapes moving in her field of vision, and she felt as if she was separated from her body. Which of the following classifications of psychoactive drugs did Yi likely take? This concludes video part four, psychoactive substances. Make sure you check the answers to the multiple choice questions. Also check your understanding of the content in this video by seeing if you can answer the questions on the right hand side of the screen and define the key concepts listed as well.